the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. The prayers of the Mass can be found in your missals as the prayers of the 5th Sunday after the Epiphany. If you turn to the Christmas time in your missals and you find the Feast of the Epiphany and look at the Sundays after that, you'll find the 5th Sunday after the Epiphany, and there you'll find the prayers for today's Mass. But there is also added the second oration, which is the oration from the Feast of All Saints on November 1st. We are now within the octave of this great Feast of All Saints. Now the epistle for this, the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Brethren, put ye on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, the heart of mercy, benignity, humility, modesty, patience, <coughs> bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If any have a complaint against another, even as the Lord hath forgiven you, so do you also. But above all these things have charity, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ rejoice in your hearts, wherein also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you abundantly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual canticles, singing in grace in your hearts to God. All whatsoever you do in word or in work, all things do ye in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus spoke this parable to the multitudes. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sowed good seed in his field. But while men were asleep, his enemy came and oversowed cockle among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and had brought forth fruit, then appeared also the cockle. And the servants of the good man of the house, coming, said to him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? Whence then hath it cockle? And he said to them, An enemy hath done this. And the servants said to him, Wilt thou that we go and gather it up? And he said, No, lest perhaps gathering up the cockle you root up the wheat also together with it. Suffer both to grow until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather up first the cockle, and bind it into bundles to burn. But the wheat gather ye into my barn. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated here. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sowed good seed in his field. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, so often in the Gospel, and today's Gospel reminds us of that, our Lord speaks of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, but he's not talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God in eternity. He's talking about the church that he came to establish here on this earth, which is far from a paradise. It is not the paradise in everlasting life, which is the ultimate promise of our Lord. Our Lord rather told us that the church that he established here, which he referred to as the kingdom of God here on earth, and the kingdom of heaven here on earth, would suffer would suffer as he himself had suffered. That the church would be subject to danger. That the apostles and his own disciples would be subject to being persecuted, being charged, being imprisoned, even be put to death. That was his promise to them when he called them to him. This was to be their vocation. But he promised that the reward for all of this, their faithfulness, even in face of hardship, danger, even death, was everlasting life. Our Lord says that even in the midst of these sufferings, being faithful to him here on earth, we should be cheerful. The epistle of St. Paul to the Colossians talks about that today. He talks about singing to God in our hearts. How do we sing to God in our hearts? Well, the angels, we say, the angels sing. We even refer to the angels in heaven as choirs. How do the angels sing? They have no lungs, they have no lips, they have no tongues to sing. But they sing in the grace of God that is in them.
Their spirits sing more beautifully than any other choir ever could, just by making sound, because sound is simply noise in the air. But the singing of the angels is absolutely spectacularly beautiful. And that is how we are meant to sing to God here. We are meant to sing to God in our hearts, in our souls, by grace. That's what St. Paul says today. We are meant to sing by grace in our hearts. So those who are in the state of grace are already singing, in a sense. They're singing to God in heaven with the voices of the angels. They're singing the voices that their spirits have that require no tongues or lips or lungs, but require only grace from God. This is the great hymn of gratitude and glory that all of those who have the life of God in sanctifying grace sing continually. This is what our Lord wants of us. Now the church has gone through a great deal of suffering, as you know, and continues to have many, many adventures here on this earth. The church has had a long history, and her history is very fascinating to read and fascinating to live. You know that um, this church here has an interesting history of its own. The day was not that long ago when there would be as many as six masses offered in this church on a Sunday. And we're told by those who actually remembered from the time we moved in here in 1995, there were those who lived in the neighborhood who remembered the days when the church would be absolutely filled to capacity every Sunday six times. And even with the people spilling out through the vestibule and onto the front steps of the church because there wasn't room for them. Incredible, huh? The people would come streaming down the sidewalks of Norwood and entire families all dressed up as though for some great event because they realized they were dressed up for a great event. They were coming to meet their God who had come from heaven to meet them here at the altar and the communion rail. <laughs> and, so, and so they really dressed in their Sunday best. And they came for a sacred function, to do something very important. And they realized that. They filled these very pews, overfilled them, in fact. Sunday after Sunday, Mass after Mass, and it was this very Mass that they came to attend here, the true Mass of the Catholic Church. The faithful came and they brought their little children who would grow up to receive their First Holy Communions. And so we have the, the pictures of First Holy Communion Day with the children in their finery, the young boys with their jackets looking like young men, looking in, like young men in their suit coats, and the girls in their finery of their beautiful white dresses with their magnificent white veils, covering the steps of the church and overflowing even all the steps of the church, literally a hundred, 150 children at a time receiving our Lord in their first Holy Communion. And when I see the pictures of the children and the priests with them, I could imagine all of their parents standing around those steps and rejoicing to see their children rejoicing to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. This was not that long ago that this happened. And now it is all gone, it seems. At least the memory of this, one of three churches in Norwood, one of three great Catholic churches in Norwood that were bursting with the praise and the love for God and our Lord's divine presence in those tabernacles. What happened? The church was poisoned. The church was poisoned by Vatican II. The church was poisoned by modernism. It was a kind of revolution carried out at Vatican II. I'm not the one who made that up. It was actually stated so by none other than Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who became Benedict XVI. He actually said it out loud. He said, Vatican II was the French Revolution in the church. And it was a revolution that he helped carry out at Vatican II as a theologian with his friend and mentor, Karl Rahner. Yes, it was really a revolution. 
And you know the word revolution it comes from the same root as the word revolt. And there was a revolt against God. That's what a revolution is, a revolt against God. Interestingly enough, in the pages of St. Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians, the second epistle, St. Paul talks about a great revolt that would come. The word he used in Greek was hey apostasia, a great apostasy. Often that's translated as revolt. It's simply a revolution. That's what St. Paul was forecasting for the church at some future moment. A great revolution within the church. And that we know as the revolution of modernism in our own day. You see, there is a revolution going on throughout the entire world right now. Karl Marx the Bolsh and his Bolshevik offspring boasted of the revolution. They claimed they would bring revolution to the entire world. We see the fruits of this revolution in Cuba. We see it now in Venezuela, a country where people used to have enough to eat and enough to wear. They used to have the basic necessities of life so they could live comfortably, but not anymore because the revolution of socialism. Socialism has taken over Venezuela through the revolutionaries who are friends of Francis, actually. In charge of Venezuela now is the strongman Maduro. In fact, the people are starving down there. They're scrounging through the waste to try to find something to eat and find their children. This is the wonderful fruit of the revolution of socialism. So that there is talk about overthrowing Maduro, but coming to the rescue is Francis. Francis comes to the rescue and says that he will broker peace talks uh, between Maduro, the socialist uh, tyrant in Venezuela, and the opposition. And so Maduro was saved by Francis now, and so was the revolution in Venezuela, saved by Francis when the people were on the verge of rising up and overthrowing it. But Maduro said that the revolution would continue in any case without him. In fact, the revolutionaries of socialism talk about the revolution as though it is some kind of divine thing going on, as though it's something uh, larger than life, something superhuman, almost supernatural. And so it is with the modernists at Vatican II. They talk about what they've done in the church as something that just must continue and must carry on forever. The Masons called the revolution in the church the revolution en permanence, the permanent, ongoing, endless revolution. Well, the evolution, revolution in the church by modernism and the revolution in society by socialism go hand in hand. And we shouldn't be surprised to find that they lead to other darker, deeper things. After Vatican II, the revolution was very much in evidence to people who were paying attention. In 1968, the first of the sacraments was changed. It was the right of ordaining deacons and priests and bishops. And that's where the modernists started with their revolution in the sacraments. The revolution in, this, in the sacrament of holy orders, the rites by which their bishops and their priests and their deacons became bishops and priests and deacons. And again, for those who were watching carefully, they would have been amazed to find out something that the new rite by which their bishops and priests and deacons were made changed so dramatically that suddenly they were called into question. For example, the rite of ordaining priests. Suddenly, the young priests they were ordaining who were coming to their parishes and taking over, suddenly those young priests were never told by the bishop at their ordination, receive the power to forgive sins. The, the statement that our Lord made to his apostles, receive the power to forgive sins, go and forgive. Now no longer were priests going to be told that when they were ordained. And together with that, no longer were they told, receive the power to offer sacrifice for the living and the dead. Now you think about the significance of that, that that was omitted from the ceremony of ordaining priests. What does that mean to offer sacrifice for the living 
and for the dead? Well, you can find out very easily. You have missiles to follow the Mass. You have them in your hands right now, or sitting beside you in the pew. You can pick them up and turn to the offertory. You know, we're only shortly away from the offertory here in the Mass right now. And I'll pick up the, the host, and I'll hold it up before me, and I'll raise it before the tabernacle and before the crucifix. And I'll look up at our, the figure of our Lord on the crucifix, and I will say this prayer. To God, the Father Almighty in heaven, I will offer him an oblation, an offering. An offering for what? An offering for the forgiveness of sins. Whose sins? My sins. And your sins. And the sins of all faithful all the faithful, not only living throughout the world today, but who ever lived, including all of those who've gone before us, lived and died before us, I will offer that sacrifice for forgiveness of sins for all the faithful living and dead. That's the sacrifice that is offered for the living and the deceased. It is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. It can't be any other. There is no other sacrifice offered for the forgiveness of sins for all of the faithful. It is the sacrifice of our Lord, his own life, his own death on Calvary. That's the sacrifice. No longer were the priests in the new rite of ordination to the priesthood told by the bishop, receive the power to offer sacrifice for the living and the dead. A revolution. A revolution, indeed. And know that that sacrifice had been brought up. That was the next to go, to fall under the modernist axe. The modernist scissors would cut and chop and edit so that the very prayer that I mentioned here in the offertory doesn't exist anymore in the new Mass. It was totally removed. All trace of it is gone, including a prayer that shortly comes after at the offering of the chalice when we ask our Lord for mercy. That has been taken out too. Now we have, we give thee thanks that we have this bread to eat. It will become our spiritual, spiritual food. We have this, we give thee thanks that we have this wine to offer. It will become our spiritual drink. That's all that's left now. Of those two prayers, nothing in other words. They're not those prayers at all. Not even close. So the new rite of the Liturgy of the so-called Mass has been changed. The Lord's Supper, as they prefer to call it. Or just the, not even Holy Eucharist, just Eucharist. And so, these things have been swept away by a revolution. And the Church, the Church herself, has suffered great consequences. There's so many good people, conservative within the Novus Ordo who still have the faith. They still do have the faith and they still love God very much. They don't see though, they don't see the contradiction that is there. We have to pray for them. Every, every week that goes by, some of them seem to join us back at the traditional Mass because God is calling them because they still have the faith. It survived the Novus Ordo. Amazing. Well, you look back not long ago in the walls of this very church, you find some wonderful things. You know, this, this is this uh, St. Matthew's Parish was established back in 1906, the time of St. Pius X, 110 years ago. And uh, the little clapboard, wooden clapboard church that was basically standing outside the back door of the rectory today where the garage is, that church was overfilled in three years after it was built. And so the building here on the corner of Kenilworth and Floral began in 1909. And uh, that became the church on the ground floor where the Mass, this Mass, was offered. And the above, the, the upper floor was the classrooms until finally this church was begun in 1922 and finally completed in 1924. And so while this parish, St. Matthew's, was thriving, World War I came and went, and the young men of this parish were called to go. 
And the ladies met here and prayed for their sons and their fathers and their husbands to come back alive. We still have some vestiges in the church of that time of what people left in thanksgiving because their loved ones returned alive from World War I. In 1917, Our Lady was appearing at Fatima. And the, again, the church was thriving here. This St. Matthew's Parish was growing and growing. But Our Lady had predicted a second war worse than the first in the time of Pope Pius XI. And so this church was also here during that great war. And it used to be filled evening after evening. This church would be filled during the days of World War II. Filled with whom? <clears throat> with the women. <clears throat> the women of this neighborhood. From blocks away, the women would walk here. Rain or shine. In the heat of the summer, and the cold of the day, they would come. They would come and they would pray. And they would pray that their sons would come back alive. That their husbands would come back alive and whole. They would pray that their fathers, the children, would come and pray that their daddies would come back to them. Day after day during World War II, the prayers were going up from this church. It was filled by the ladies and the older men and the children praying. Their devotion was to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Now those of you who are with us from that time that we moved in here in 1995, you know that the statue, the marble statue that was here, of Our Lady was not of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. But that statue was taken away when we acquired this church and the Nova Sordo came in and took away the statues and took away the crucifixes and ripped out even the relics from the altars. And in place of the statue that was here, what did God send? A beautiful statue of Our Lady of Perpetual Help, which I see as a kind of memorial to the prayers that were poured out of this church during World War II for the safe deliverance of our nation, but the safe deliverance in particular of the men of this parish, the brave soldiers, that they would come back from thousands of miles away and not wind up with a white cross over their grave in the poppy fields of France, that Our Lady of Perpetual Help indeed wanted to be here in a special way. But I wonder if those prayers, I wonder if those prayers that were offered in 1941 and 1942 and 1943 and 44 and 45, I wonder if those prayers had been prayed in 1931 and 1932 and 1933 and 4 and 5. I wonder if just 10 years earlier those prayers that were poured out so earnestly here in the 1940s, if they had been offered here in the 1930s, would there have been a World War II? Would they have had to have been here praying that their sons and their fathers and their husbands survive a world war. In 1940s, if they had been praying already in 1930s, I, when Our Lady asked for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart, according to our Blessed Mother, it would have made the difference. Well, now we are in a situation where we have the opportunity to pray, and I wonder if uh, 10 years or a year from now, 10 years or 10 months from now, we'll be trying to get to this church to beg our Lord to deliver us from some terrible evil that is hanging over our heads right now. And we'll be thinking then, if only we had prayed when we could to avert this evil, if only we could have prayed to avoid the evil, 
Now we are dealing with it and we're praying God to deliver us from it. God forbid. But it may well happen. Because it happens over and over again. That the people finally find their knees when there's some terrible burden weighing on their shoulders. But we have the holy hours on Thursday nights and there are very few people here. Everybody's got something better to do. Sometimes it is impossible, I know. But do they still pray anyway? Do they join in the prayers at home with their families? Do they at least keep some kind of a holy hour at home? I don't know. Are they even mindful of what's being prayed here on Thursday nights? I don't know. But I'd much rather be here now on Thursday nights and praying that God will avert a terrible evil from our country than be here 10 weeks or 10 months from now or even 10 days from now praying that God will save us from the disaster <laughs> that has struck. But so it is, so we are as human beings. We just carry on and repeat the same mistakes again and again and seem to never learn how sad. Well, we have discovered here something that some people had already known for a long time but didn't actually say because it would have sounded so outrageous. But the fact is, it is now coming to light that our country has been taken over by a cabal of Satanists. Our country is now, and I'm talking about in the highest echelons of our government, our country now is in the, in the grip of Satanic worshippers. A cabal of Satanists have gotten into our country, have taken over the highest positions of rule in our country, have promoted each other and protected each other against discovery, against prosecution, and they are now poised to tighten that grip very, very firmly around the throat of our country. Yes, Satanists, actually practicing Satanists. Is that surprising? It shouldn't be. For any of you who have any knowledge of the Franklin cover-up, you, you would know that this was in the offing. And yet it's so fantastic, who would believe it? And even now that it's come to light, those who are part of this are making a big joke of it as though it's something funny that people actually think this is true, but it's true. It is absolutely true. Back in the 1960s, the Vatican had satanic worship taking place. Even in the Vatican, satanic worship. It has been made, made evident. It has been reported by people. Some of them widely read. Even some national bestsellers reported that the Vatican was hosting satanic worship within its walls. But at the time, of course, no one paid attention. We cannot be surprised, though, to find out that revolutions are carrying on here, and we're watching them take place before our very eyes, almost in disbelief, even though we know that there's something very sinister going on. But anybody, again, who knows about abortion, who understands what abortion is, you realize that this is all part of this satanic sacrifice that is being offered. In the old days, they would offer their children to Moloch. Today, they sacrifice the children in a very different way, but in a much more evil way. And so we realize that our young people who are taking the lead in the pro-life effort are actually addressing the evil on the front lines. God bless them for that. Pray for them. But the evil is there, and the only answer is prayer. St. Paul tells you in the Epistle to the Colossians what he wants you to do. He wants you to sing in your hearts by grace to God. He wants you to be in the state of grace. He wants you to be in the state of grace always and everywhere. Despite the temptations of the world around you that are probably more serious than the temptations has ever been, have ever been in the history of mankind. They're everywhere, it seems. You have that scapular around your shoulders. You have the scapular hanging in your breast. Don't do anything with that scapular on you that you would be ashamed of before God and the angels. Don't do anything to offend God. Don't do anything that would destroy the life of grace in your soul. While you're wearing the scapular of Our Lady and consecrated to her,
There are things coming to light today that show that the satanic influence in this country is very deep. And yet the names of those who are behind this, I would be ashamed to mention to you because if you went and looked them up, you would find very evil things that might even be a source of temptation because it is, they're so absolutely corrupt. So I wouldn't want you to even go looking up some of these things or some of these people who are being mentioned now in the press as being principals in this satanic influence within the government of the United States of America. But we know the only defense is a love for God, is our faith in God. That's all we have that is adequate to deal with this evil. And so we have to reach for that. And we have to pray for those who still have that faith and who still have that love for God to regather around the altar. Not the table, the altar. And we have to ask God to have mercy. And we have to plead with God to have mercy. We have to implore heaven to have mercy on us and our country and our church. I ask you, please, take St. Paul very seriously. Read what he says to the Colossians. Put it into practice. And pray. Pray what? Pray as Our Lady asks you to. Pray the gospel. How do you pray the gospel? You pray the rosary. That's praying the gospel. You pray the rosary. <clears throat> Remain in the state of grace. Receive the sacraments as often as you can. Especially our Lord in Holy Communion. Receive him worthily and make an act of love for him. Do you realize this is what is offsetting all of this evil and driving it back? It is what drives back all of this evil. Is your prayer and your sacrifice and your, the things that you do out of love for God. These are the things that drive back this evil, that drive back this darkness. And I ask you to please consecrate yourselves to our Blessed Mother's Immaculate Heart, as she asked at Fatima. If you consecrate yourself to her Immaculate Heart, in the very process, you're necessarily being referred to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And there, there we will find, and there alone we can find salvation. There alone can we find the remedy to all of these evil things. <laughs> well, I ask you to do this in the days ahead, as you've never done it before, to pledge your fidelity to our Lord so that everyone will know where you stand and what you believe and what matters to you. You may not be able by your prayers to save the world, you may not be able by your prayers to save the country. But this much you do know, that Our Lady has promised that those who are devoted to her, God has given her the power to protect them. And she will protect you and your loved ones if you will find a refuge here in this world right now in her immaculate heart and bring your hearts very close to hers in uniting with her in the prayer of her heart, which is the prayer of of love for her divine Son, Jesus, our Lord. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.